Five Bob Stompers. Billy Bat. Wow. What a difference a, a week makes, huh? A lot has happened. And I would just like to start out the service with a prayer. Let's pray. During this stage of the COVID-19 epidemic, we pray to you, oh God. God, help us to remain calm as we face whatever it is out there with uncertainty. When there's an onslaught of information that comes to us from all sides, Lord, help us to discern reason from panic. When fear makes it hard to breathe and anxiety seems to be the order of the day, slow us down, God. Help us to reach out with our hearts when we can't reach out with our hands. Help us to be socially connected when we have to be socially distant. Help us to, to love as perfectly as we can, knowing that perfect love casts out all fear. We pray for the doctors and for nurses. We pray for the housekeeping staff in the hospitals. We pray for the technicians. We pray for the custodians and the aides and the caregivers. We pray for the researchers and the theorists, theorists and the epidemiologists and the investigators. We pray for those who are sick and those who are grieving. We pray for all who are affected all around the world. And we pray for our own and our loved ones' safety and health. Lord, may we continue to do what we can to feed the hungry, to give drink to the thirsty, to clothe the naked, and house those without homes. May we walk with those who feel they are alone. May we do all that we can to help heal the sick in spite of the pandemic and in spite of the fear that we are now experiencing. Help us, O oh Lord, that we might help each other. In the name of the Creator, in the name of the Healer, and in the existence of the Holy Spirit that is in all and with all, we pray. Amen. I invite you now to join me in our in our call to worship. It's a responsive reading, and I will read the leg print if you respond back with the full print. We follow Christ. We follow Christ. We follow Christ. Come, let us worship our Creator. Kids, you want to come on up? Yeah. All right. Hi, everybody. Hi. So, you like my little thing there? That's not it. It's not actually my thing. There was a whole bunch of them here at church when I got here yesterday, and um, they came from from a family that um, just felt it on their heart that they should make up all these little bags to um, for us to give out to people that might not be able to make it to church. So that got me thinking about Lent, and one of the things that people do during the season of Lent is they give stuff up, right? Have you ever heard of that? What are you giving up for Lent? That? Yeah. What? So, that also got me thinking. And really, Lent isn't like, you know, your second chance at a New Year's resolution. You're not going to, you know, that's, that's not what it's for. Um, you know what Lent is? Lent is a 40 days that Jesus was out in the desert, struggling struggling, but he eat right, and he was being tested, and it was not a fun time, one little bit. And so, it's the 40 days leading up to Easter, and that's the time that we're supposed to be, you know, maybe doing some some more deep thinking about Jesus, and about um, how we can be better uh, at following Jesus. And, and so, one of the things that the Bible tells us to do is to encourage each other. And so that's what these bags are here. That sometimes, you know, this whole COVID thing, you've heard about all that, right? That's going around. Um, so people that are, are maybe um, more likely to get sick or they're, you know, 
know, something's going on. They might have to stay in their houses for a longer time, so they're not exposed to germs. That you know, they don't go places where they might pick up some germs. And so I thought that what we could do is we could be encouragers, like the Bible tells us to do. And if anybody has a neighbor that might be, you know, in their house for a long time, or or somebody that you know might be sick, if you want to take one of these bags and put it on your doorknob and just knock and walk away, um, you just let me know, all right? So um, so that we can all be encouragers, and even if you're not even giving out bags, but just you know giving encouraging words to each other, and maybe helping a little extra if we can do that. Um, because things are going to look a little bit different um, in the next few weeks. Who knows what's going to happen? I did hear that we might not have school for a while. So who knows? Who knows? What, and I know it's not vacation. No. So I have to do school. Yes. Might not go to school. We'll see. So, okay. I know, isn't that cute? Here's a hedgehog. All right, let's say a little prayer, all right? Dear Jesus, during the season of Lent, help us to give up discouraging words and instead help us to encourage each other every single day. Amen. All right, thank you.
condemnation for those who are in Jesus Christ. Because though Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit of life, set me free from the law of sin and death, for what the laws, the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the sinful nature, God did by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a, to be a sin offering. And so he commend, condemned, condemned sin in, in sinful man in order that the righteous requirements of the law may be fully met in us who do not live according to the sinful nature but according to the Spirit. Psalms 51, the of reading. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. According to your love and mercy, Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only have I have sinned and done that which is evil in your sight, so that you are justified in your sentence and blameless in your judgment. Be behold, I was born into your iniquity. Behold, you desire truth in the inward being. Therefore, teach me wisdom in my secret heart. For you to be the and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me hear with joy and gladness, let the bones which you have broken rejoice. I hide your face from my sins, and blot out all my Create in me a clean heart, O God, and put a new and right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence, and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and sustain in me a willing spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners will return to you. Deliver me from death, O God, God of my salvation. Tongue will sing aloud of your deliverance. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth shall show forth your grace. For you have no delight in sacrifice, where I give a, a burnt offering, you would not be pleased. So sacrifice acceptable to God is the will of the Spirit, a broken and perfect heart. O God, you will not despise. we've been exploring um, the last words that Jesus spoke from the cross. And today, we come to, as we come to those, the next set of words, we find ourselves listening in on a deathbed um, conversation between three dying men. It begins with one of the criminals mocking Jesus. And then it continues with the other criminal defending Jesus and recognizing Jesus' role. And it concludes with Jesus pardoning the repentant man and giving him eternal life. So let's lean in and listen to what was said in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 30, or chapter 23, verses 39 through 43. One of the criminals who was hanging there kept deriding him and saying, Are you not the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed have been condemned justly, for we are getting what we deserve for our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. He replied, quite truly, I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. So it's the reading of God's word. So let's pull apart verse 43 and take a deeper look. First of all, the phrase, in paradise. 
Have you ever wondered what heaven's like? I certainly have. Yeah? I wonder where it is. I wonder what we're going to do there. I wonder if it's going to be fun. I worry that it might be boring. I wonder what we're going to wear. What will we eat? What will we do? Where will we live? I wonder whether or not we will recognize people in their new bodies. And I wonder what those new bodies are actually going to look like. What will the climate be? Will it be rural? Will it, will it be urban? How will we get along around? How high will we be able to jump? How fast will we be able to run? Will those of us who are married still be partners in some little celestial way with surpasses the marriage as we know it here on Earth? Will we hang out with the angels? Will we eat lunch with Jesus? Where are there going to be animals? And in particular, will beloved family pets who have gone on before us, will they put their cute little wet noses in the palm of our hands and ask us for a, a daily walk? And if, if so, then where are we going to walk them to? Are there going to be seniors and babies and middle-aged people, or are we all going to be the same age? Will we see the face of God? Will all of our questions finally be answered? Because I have a lot of questions. <laughs> Paradise. That's the word that Jesus used on the cross to describe heaven. And it's very, very rare in the Bible. It's actually a, a Persian word, meaning enclosure or park, or, or a garden, and this is the first time that this word appears in scripture. The next time is in the book of 2 Corinthians, where Paul is talking about an out-of-body out experience that transports him to a place that he calls the third heaven. And the final time we come across the word paradise is in the book of Revelation, where John's vision is described in awe-inspiring details. Again, it is Jesus who used this word when he promised, to him who overcomes, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. The reference to the tree of paradise, or the tree of life in the paradise of God, suggests that paradise is not just any kind of garden or enclosure. It's the sinless, weedless, painless garden of Eden that we have heard described in the book of Genesis, where it says, Now the Lord had planted a garden in the east, in Eden, and there he put the man he had formed. This paradise is what Jesus promised the criminal after his death. So this is how we may picture heaven and eternal life. It's probably not going to be some misty, I don't know, disembodied experience that we find in some galaxy far, far away. Instead, I truly think that we are destined to live and work and play and find community with our Creator and our fellow mortals in a place of great beauty filled with color and sound and life and meaningful activities. How many of us find immense pleasure in gardening? I wonder if that urge to work in the soil is, is actually a longing to return not just to nature, but to our first home, that lush, green garden that God had originally created. So how about the next phrase? You will be with me. One of the most excruciating experiences, experiences in life is to be left out, to be unwanted. And I suspect that the thief on the cross knew the pain of rejection. I base that on the fact that he is called both a criminal and a robber in all of the Gospels. 
we also have his own admission that he deserved execution. So I don't think that we would be far off to imagine that he is a misfit, a person who is a, abandoned and perhaps even unloved. My guess is that there is no one on Golgotha that day to mourn his death. My guess is that he lived his life believing that no one would want anything to do with him, especially someone like Jesus who had done nothing wrong. Imagine, then, his shocked reaction when Jesus looked him in the eye and he said, you will be with me. You and me, Jesus, you must have thought? How could that possibly be? Someone who was usually picked last and then inexplicably was chosen first for once, he must have looked at Jesus with disbelief. You and me, a king and a con man, a ruler and a robber, a savior and a sinner, together forever, you and me? Jesus must have received that exact same re reaction time and time again during his life as despised tax collectors and prostitutes and lepers felt his love and acceptance. How many others before and how many others since have been shocked to hear that Jesus wanted to be with them? How many of us have not thought you and me, Jesus, in paradise? And yet, that is precisely the heart of the good news. That there is a God who wants to be with us. As a matter of fact, that good news is clearly heard in the promise of the coming Messiah. Quoted in the Christmas story in the book of Matthew, it says, the virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son. And they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. Like the criminal, we are shocked at the news that God is more than willing to stoop down to us. We should never forget that in the original paradise, God created humans not only to tend to the garden, but to enjoy fellowship together. You get a strong sense of that when we read in Genesis, then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden on the cool of the day. And they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, where are you? So here's the thing. We were created to be in fellowship with God. God's goal is to be with us again. And God's agent of reconciliation is Jesus. The phrase, you will be with me, is what the Bible is all about. It's the reason Jesus came to live and to die. Looking at it from our point of view, like the criminal, we should be totally shocked. We may think, why would Jesus want to spend time with me? But looking at it from the Lord's point of view, however, we should not be shocked at all. God wants nothing more than to walk with us in the garden, just like that faithful day when Adam and Eve hid in fear. Here's the truth. Jesus loved the criminal on the cross and wanted to be with him. And Jesus loves us and wants to be with us. Thankfully, the criminal experienced love just before he died. And yet, regrettably, he did not experience that love until just then. How different 
his life would have been had he only lived it with Jesus walking by his side. The grace that was there for the hardened criminal is there for us, too. All we have to do is to ask, and God will say, you will be with me. And that leads us to the final phrase, I tell you the truth. Do you believe this? The criminal did. And I do too, and I'll, I'll tell you why. This world is full of those who make up alternative truths. The robber knew some of those folks, and actually he was one of them as well. This world is also full of speculators, and I certainly recognize myself as a person who loves to speculate about the future, and even what life will be like after death. On the other hand, there is the one voice of truth that can fully be trusted. He is the one who began so many of his teachings by saying the words, Verily, verily, I say unto you. And Jesus also said, I tell you the truth. Here's the thing. Everyone needs a place to stand. A starting place for developing a world and a life view. And that place to stand must be trustworthy and it must be true. And that true place to stand is Jesus, who said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. In fact, there was and is nothing false or dishonest about him. There was nothing unreliable or untrustworthy about him. People heard him preach, and they saw him do miracles. They watched him carry the cross, and they were amazed at his authority. He has never lied to us or let us down or, or steered us wrong. And that's why we can base our view of life and death on every word he has ever uttered, including these words spoken on the cross to the criminal who was crucified with him. I urge you to do what Jesus advised his followers to do when he told them in the book of John, if you hold to my teachings, you are really my disciples then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. After a life of lying and being lied to, the man crucified with Jesus, he shook himself free from the opinion of that other criminal, and separated himself from the mob hostility that was aimed at Jesus, and he decided to take a leap of faith he turned to Jesus, and he put his trust in him. And when he did that, Jesus looked at him with a heart full of compassion and eyes full of promise. And he said, I tell you the truth. And after a lifetime of rejection and deception and violence, the criminal died in peace. And he entered paradise with Jesus at his side. Now, isn't that the way we want to live? Isn't that the way we want to die? Isn't that the way we want to live again? Well then, let's make that so. Amen? Now is a time of the service where we lift up our prayers of joys and concerns and whatever it is that we want to share with the community of the United Church of Two Harbors to pray over. And I prepare prayer requests at this time. It's Milo's birthday now. She's turning seven. Wow. Milo's birthday tomorrow and she is turning seven. Lord in your mercy. Uh, for all the workers, like the 
the workers at the arenas, workers on the ships, hotel workers, and so on, who uh, are not going to be getting paid for a while. Yeah, for all the workers that may be getting laid off and not be able to make a paycheck, um, keeping all those people in their prayers. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. So, huge appreciation for the Fox Doctors coming and providing music for us today. And also for those times that we are still able to gather in community. Oh, Lord, in your mercy. Jody. I have two. One is, continue, please continue prayers for our niece, Lita. Continuous battle with breast cancer. That's the first one. So prayers for Lita, um, who has been going through this horrendous battle of cancer for the last five years. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. Our second one is a prayer of joy. Um, we, after 33 years of my sister living in Northfield, we moved her to Duluth on Friday, and we are so happy to have her close to us, and she is adjusting well, and we are very relieved with that. Oh, wonderful. Jody's sister, did you say 33 years? She was in Northfield for 33 years. Wow. So she is now up here, well, in Duluth, and adjusting well. So, Lord, in your mercy. Prayers for all the people in, with the coronavirus. Um, I just heard from my friend Moses, who's a, a pastor in Kenya, and they just got their first um, positive test, person who, who tested positive for coronavirus yesterday. So it's indeed a worldwide pandemic. So Lord, in your mercy. Louise and then Kelly. As I heard, Governor, just briefly heard Governor Walls say that uh, Minnesotans know what to do when times get tough. We can support one another. That's exactly right. Supporting each other is just so very, very important. So thank goodness for, for um, leaders that will say that out loud. Lord, in your mercy. Yep. For uh, Jackson, who will be starting a new job when school starts back up uh, with the YMCA as a youth leader, after school program, youth leader at a Duluth public school. Oh, that's wonderful. So, first of joy for Jackson, who will be starting a new job as a youth leader at the Y in Duluth. At a public school. At a public school. When it all gets started again. Yeah. Lord, in your mercy. Boss. Gary Swanson. Prayers for Gary Swanson. Lord, in your mercy. Let's pray. Sometimes, oh God, it seems as though we have too much. Too much violence, too much anxiety, too many demands and problems, too many broken dreams. Too much war, too much greed, simply too much to bear. So here we are again, coming to you with that which is on our minds. Thankfully we can pray. Thankful that you promise to hear us. And thankful that being here reminds us that we are not alone. We pray, O oh God, for the nations of the world that you would guide their rulers to set aside fear and greed and ambition. Help them and Help us to see the world and all its children as yours. 
people in need of security and equal opportunity, people deserving of meaningful work and empowering education, creatures in need of clean air and clean water and clean food. Be with nations where natural, natural disasters have occurred and keep occurring, floods and fires, cyclones and droughts have ravaged the lives of thousands of people. Be their refuge and strength through the agencies and the workers providing aid. We pray for those who struggle with anxiety and depression. Pray that each day they would see a glimmer of your light that would be enough to get them through just one more day. Gracious Lord, be with people we know and love. Provide hope and assurance to those whose health is threatened. Be a gentle presence for those who have lost the love of their lives. Provide wisdom and humor to parents in the throes of raising children. Hear us now in a moment of our own silent prayer as we lift up the names of those friends and loved ones, especially in need of your grace. Lord of all compassion, we pray for ourselves that you soften the places in our hearts that have become hardened, that you would replace cynicism with real hope, that you would teach us how you want us to serve you, and that you would grant us the gift of gratitude and joy. Bless this church just as you have throughout its history, preserving our desire to be of service, binding us more firmly in your love, and igniting us again and again to be your light to everyone who needs your light. We are a restless people, dear Lord, restless and wandering, sometimes up, sometimes down, sometimes hopeful, sometimes despairing. And so we need you. We know that, even though we keep forgetting. Remind us as often as is necessary that we do need you, but also that you do love us. We pray all of this in the dear name of your Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray, say together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us.
Please join me in our offering prayer. Generous God, we take our gifts and use them so that we may be a part of your great work in this world. Through our giving, bring a brighter day of justice and love. Not just our community, but in the world beyond these walls. Strengthen our church so that we grow together today into the powerful voice for healing and peace. Amen. All right, now some announcements. First off, I'll open it up. And the up, okay. Yes, yeah, just a reiteration that we are still going to meet down in the church basement after this for anyone who would like to um, see our slides and um, a few videos of sailing and what we've been up to and what we've been up to. Feel free to come. So, following the service, there is going to be fellowship and um, and the words we're going to tell us all about their adventures. Um, so, looking forward to that. Uh, other announcements? Mark. Maybe hey, Paul, you're going to address this, but uh, <laughs> some of the people know that, uh, you know, with the whole coronavirus thing, the council, we have been doing some emailing and we are going to meet after the service today to kind of discuss the plan. And the good news is we do, because of Jose, we really are on top of sort of the technology more than a lot of churches. And so we're going to discuss ways that we can use that um, to continue service. But I think I would just like to say that our top priority is to, we're going to have a service every Sunday, whether it's a virtual one or one year, but, um, but that's what we're going to do. We're going to discuss it with some of these events. Mark, what about music to be the soul? We're going to decide that probably right afterwards. Too. My guess is, Right, we've already put in several um, steps in addressing this coronavirus, and we do take this extremely seriously. And your health and well-being is of utmost importance. So, first off, I would reiterate that if you feel at all comfortable about leaving your home, um, please, please do what it is that you need to do to to keep yourself safe and healthy. Um, so here we are having self-serve um, booths where you put your collection in the plates and you grab your own bulletin. We haven't done um, Passing the Peace for a long time, so we're, above the, we're ahead of the curve on that one. And we've gone, um, we have our services every single Sunday online. So this is old hat, and we're just going to be ramping up and we'll just be more aware. We're going to be doing communion differently, so there's no hand touching on anything. Um, so um, please keep keep um, giving me suggestions, or anybody on the council, really. And um, we're just going to keep moving forward and, and pray that, you know, we shall weather this. We shall. Any other announcements? Well, if not, I have this quote here from the rabbi Yosef um, Kenefiski. And he said, every hand that we don't shake must become a phone call that we do make. Every embrace that we avoid must become a verbal expression of warmth and concern. Every inch and every foot that we physically place between ourselves and another must become a thought as to how we might be of help to that other should the need arise. Now, go in peace. The box songers are going to be playing our sending music. And the first song is going to be Get In Line, Brother. If you want to stand up, you guys can sit for a long time to do that. But I would encourage after that song to just sit back down until they're totally done because you don't want to miss it. The words are on screen.